Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to today's session. With this session, we start a series of sessions on pyrexia of unknown origin or PUO or FUO as it is often commonly called. We will be discussing what is this condition and we will be discussing the various common causative agents of pyrexia of unknown origin over the next few lectures. We will be outline of today's lecture first will be in the definition of PUO, its classification, which are the etiological agents which can cause PUO and the non-infectious causes of PU also will be asked to be covered. Now, what exactly is pyrexia of unknown origin? It was formally defined in 1961 by Peters, Dorff and Beeson. They defined it as temperature more than 38.3 degrees centigrade on several occasions. Patient has had the illness for more than 3 weeks and diagnosis has not been established even after 1 week of inpatient investigation. Only then should it be called pyrexia of unknown origin. Classification, it was later on classified. The classification was proposed by Durack and Street, and this was essentially after HIV came on the scenario and also presented sometimes as PUO. They divided PUO into four classes the classical PUO, as referred to in Peters Dorff definition, hospital acquired PUO, immunocompromised or neutropenic PUO, and HIV related PUO. Now, let us see what all these are. The first is the classical PUO or the definition which we have already seen of PUO which is temperature more than 38.3 degrees centigrade, illness more than 3 weeks and where diagnosis has not been established even after 1 week of investigation. So, this is the definition of PUO as given by Peters, Dorff and Beeson and it is now referred to as a classical PUO. Hospital acquired PUO if there is a temperature more than 38.3 degrees occurring in a patient who has been hospitalized for at least 24 hours no obvious source of infection that could have been present before admission can be detected. Immune deficient PUO is again recurrent temperatures of more than 38.3 degrees centigrade assessed for at least 3 days without establishing an etiology for fever. So, now this is 3 days we serve as the classical PUO where we have said 1 week. Neutrophil counts are less than 500 per cubic millimeters. HIV associated PUO is the temperature is more than 38.3 degrees centigrade patient has been evaluated for 3 days, fever has been present for more than 4 weeks in outpatient and more than 3 days in inpatient and HIV infection has been confirmed in the patient. So, these are 4 variations of pyrexia of unknown origin which you may come across in clinical practice. The common etiological agents can be bacterial, viral, parasitic, fungal and non-infectious causes also. The common bacterial causes are Salmonella, Brucella, Leptospirosis, Mycobacterium whether the classical Mycobacterium tuberculosis or the atypical Mycobacteria, Chlamydia, Cytokai, Rickettsia, Coxiella burnetii and Mycoplasma. The viral agents are Cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, Arboviruses, Enterovirus and HIV. These are some of the common viruses which can present with PUO. The etiological agents from the fungal group are Candida albicans, Cryptococcus neoformans, Histoplasma capsulatum, Aspergillus species and Coxididus immatis. The common parasites which present with PU are Plasmodium or the malarial parasite presenting as malaria, Leishmania, Wichereria bancrofti presenting as Filaria, Brugia malai, Entamoeba hysteritica, Trypanosoma and Toxoplasma gondii. So, we will just cover the non-infectious causes also though we will not be discussing them in detail. Neoplasm such as lymphoma, leukemia, myeloma, renal, colon and liver cancers, connective tissue disorders such as systemic lupus erythematosus, polyarthritis nodosa, metabolic disorders such as gout, porphyria, granulomatous diseases such as Crohn's disease, sarcoidosis, rheumatoid arthritis and polymyositis can also present sometimes as febrile illness. Now, let us start with the first of these that is enteric fever which is one of the most common causes of fever or presenting as pyrexia of unknown origin where the co causative agent is the salmonella group of organisms. Now, a 30 year old male patient presenting to the outpatient with complaints of fever, headache and malaise of 10 days duration. When he was examined he looked toxic, 
tongue was coated, pulse was 70 per minute, BP was 110 by 70 millimeters of mercury, temperature was 39.4 degrees centigrade. So, though he had fever, the pulse was not rapid. Systemic examination, the liver appeared normal, not enlarged, spleen was enlarged 2 centimeters below the diaphragm, smooth, respiratory system was normal, lungs were clear, other systemic examination also no abnormalities were detected. Laboratory investigations were started in the hemogram, polymorphs were not raised, but leukocytosis was observed, ESR was moderately elevated, on the peripheral blood smear no malarial parasites were detected, gram positive cocci in chains were seen in the sputum, acid fast stain no AFB were detected in the sputum, in the stool examination also no ova or cysts were detected. Then serological examinations were started, 5 ml of blood was collected in a plain vacutainer, serum was separated and used for various serological tests. Since the patient had shown gram positive cocci, ASO titers were done, they were within the normal range for rheumatic fever, ELISA test was done for various viruses such as HIV, CMV and EBV, all of them were negative. Other serological tests were done, standard agglutination test of the SAT for brucellosis, the wheel felix test for rickettsia the Paul Ballon test for infectious mononucleosis and an ELISA IgM test was done for leptospirosis. All these tests were negative also. Then unusual organisms were looked for like a complement fixation test was done for the chlamydia group of organisms, chlamydia trachomatis, chlamydia cytokai, Francis Taylor tularensis and Q fever, all these were negative. Vidal test was done by using a slide test which can be a point of care test also which is a rapid test which is done, it is usually a done as a qualitative screening test and not a confirmatory test. It was positive in TO and TH which indicated that the patient could be suffering from typhoid fever or a salmonella typhi infection. So, please note the agglutination in the TH and the TO which was seen, all the others were negative. Specifically the negative control and the positive control were negative. So, to confirm this the Vidal tube test was set up, it is a quantitative test for measuring the HNO agglutinins for typhoid and paratyphoid bacilli in the patient's serum. Antigens which are used for this test are the H antigen of Salmonella typhi, H antigen of Salmonella paratyphi A and B and the O antigen of Salmonella typhi. Equal volumes of the patient's serum are taken in doubling dilutions and antigens mentioned above are added to this particular serum dilution and incubated in a water bath at 37 degrees centigrade overnight or 55 degrees for 2 hours and looked for agglutination. Usually on a single serum sample, serological tests are not evaluated, but in this case in a, sometimes you have to give some sort of a diagnosis. So, significant titer is taken if more than 100 is obtained for H and more than 200 is obtained for O, but patient is advised to come back and give a repeat sample after 7 to 10 days. The H agglutination looks like a loose cotton woolly clump which differentiated from the O agglutination which settles down as a disc at the bottom of the tube. So, picture here is showing the O agglutinin setting down as a disc at the bottom of the tube. So, they are present only in the first three tubes and not in the fourth tube. The patient's tube test showed a titer of TH 1 into 80 and TO 1 into 160. So, usually this is what the Vidal rack looks like, 4 rows of tubes are there and 4 dilutions of each one is done. The 4 rows are there for the 4 antigens which have been used for the test. The patient was asked to repeat a Vidal test after 2 weeks because both the agglutination titers were borderline because we wanted to look for a rise in titer in the convalescent serum. Now, interpretation of the Vidal test is always difficult, O antibodies usually appear 6 to 8 days after the fever and H antibodies appear 10 to 12 days after infection. All agglutination titers will depend on the stage of the disease, H agglutinins persist longer and appear later, O agglutinins appear earlier and disappear earlier. The baseline titer of the normal population should be known before interpreting a test, then only you can work out what should be taken as significant. So, depending on the overall baseline titer in India, 100 and the 200 which I mentioned in the previous slide are the current recommended what is to be taken on a single Vidal test. Other things must be kept in mind like animistic response can occur giving you a false positive Vidal test. So, it will give an unrelated rise in after any fever if the patient has had typhoid fever in the past. But if you repeat the test after a few days, you will find that the titer does not persist and gives you an indication that what you had was an anamnestic response. 
cases treated with antibiotics also may show a poor agglutinin response. Agglutinins could be present due to prior disease or immunization. Though antibody titers are raised after typhoid vaccine, they are always lower than the significant titer and usually should be taken in that context. Now, other point of care and rapid tests are available which we also attempted in this particular patient. The simplest one is the DOT ELISA which detects antibodies to both IgG and IgM against the specific 50 kilodalton OMP antigen of the Salmonella typhi. It is useful to differentiate between a recent infection and a past infection. In our particular patient, we got only a line at the M. So, the IgM titer was positive, the IgG was not positive. If the IgG was positive, we would have had a line here. Since IgM was positive, it indicated that the patient had a recent infection. A coagglutination is also another simple point of care test and it is even better than the antibody test because it detects antigen and it will come positive in the early stages of the fever also. Staphylococcus aureus, the coven 1 strain which contains protein A is coated with salmonella typhi antibodies and a 1 percent suspension is mixed with the patient serum. If antigen is present, visible agglutination results and it immediately gives you an idea that you have antigens in the patient serum. So, this is a positive test giving an idea that you have antigens in the patient serum. So, this can give you a positivity even when the patient is on antibiotics and you may not get a culture positive. Culture was also attempted in this patient because in spite of the Bovidal test being borderline and the qualitative test being positive, the gold standard for salmonella or typhoid diagnosis is usually culture. Blood has to be collected in blood culture bottles. If blood culture events persists in being negative, bone marrow can also be collected and collect transported in a blood culture bottle. It is done usually only if blood culture persists in being negative. Urine culture can also be collected in a wide mouth sterile container. Stool is collected and transported in Sachs buffered saline or Stewart's medium. In this particular patient, we collected only the blood for culture because the patient had presented to us roughly at the 10th day of fever. 15 ml of blood was collected into two blood culture bottles. One bottle contained tryptychase soya broth and the other bottle contained bile broth. If automation is available in the laboratory, it can be collected in designated blood culture bottles of that particular system. If blood culture bottles are not available as in the periphery, the clot which is left after separation of the serum can be used for culture. The blood culture bottles should be transported to the laboratory at room temperature and not under refrigeration as is done for most other samples. Blood culture bottles are incubated at 37 degrees centigrade and plated every alternate day for 3 subcultures before reporting as negative. If growth occurs, further subcultures are not done. In the case of blood clot, you can add streptokinase 100 international unit to lyse the clot and add bile broth and incubate and subculture as above. So, these are the blood culture bottles of the conventional blood culture system. These are blood culture bottles of the bacteria alert system. Again, at least two blood culture bottles must be incubated. They are again transported to the laboratory, put into the machine and when the bacteria grow in it, the machine gives a beep. The bottles are then removed from the machine and subculture onto normal media for getting the colonies and identifying them. The plating media which you would use are blood agar, McConkey's agar and if you are suspecting salmonella which we were in this particular patient, Wilson and Blair medium can be used also for plating. They should be incubated aerobically at 37 degrees and the colony is examined on the next day. On this particular patient, the colonies on blood agar were circular, smooth, convex surface with entire margins, translucent, non-hemolytic colonies were obtained. On McConkey's agar, we got non-lactose fermenter colonies which are seen in this particular plate. These are the non-lactose fermenter colonies which we got in this particular patient. Initially, they are very tiny and translucent. Later on, as you keep incubating them, they become wine leaf form colonies, irregular surfaces with serrated margins. So, they become a little rough at the margins. We also pray to this particular this thing on DCA agar, though DCA is recommended for stool samples. So, again, non-lactose fermenter colonies can be obtained, but after 48 hours, they get black centers with a clear zone around them. This is the growth of salmonella on DCA agar. Since we have plated a Wilson and Blair medium, Wilson and Blair medium essentially contains bromothymol blue, bile, bismuth sulphide. Now, in the presence of salmonella typhi, it produces the H2S, this bismuth sulphide is reduced to sulphide and you get initially green color colonies which become black in color. So, salmonella typhi gives you jet black colonies with the metallic sheen which are usually seen and after 24 to 48 hours as is shown in this particular plate. A smear was made from the colonies. Gram negative bacteria were seen, they were motile, 
their size was approximately 2 to 4 microns by 0 0.6 microns. The motility of the organism was because of a peritricus flagella, only non motile salmonella which are reported salmonella gallinanum, salmonella pulorum and salmonella typhi 901 O mutant. So, this picture is showing the gram negative medium sized bacteria which are the salmonella. This is showing the peritricus flagella around the salmonella. These are the biochemical reactions that they were put up in the laboratory. The organism was H2S positive which was also detected by paper method and it was detect detected in triple sugar iron agar by the black discoloration of the triple sugar iron. MR was positive, citrate was not utilized, ureas was ring negative, glucose and mannite were fermented with the presence of acid only. Now, this is summarized in this table. This particular organism is labeled to be S typhi because of all these reactions which we got differentiated from salmonella paratyphi A which basically gives you acid and gas in glucose and mannite and does not give you H2S positivity which we got with salmonella typhi. Salmonella paratyphi B will give you the H2S positivity and will also give you acid and gas and they can also be differentiated by lysine, arginine and ornithine, lysine hydrolysis, arginine hydrolysis and ornithine decarboxylation. So, if you get two of them positive that is lysine and arginine you know it is salmonella typhi. So, all our reactions fitted into salmonella typhi. So, the isolate was labeled as salmonella typhi. Now, salmonella typhi is known to possess certain antigens. They possess an O antigen which is associated with the body of the organism is referred to as the somatic antigen or the O antigen. <coughs> it also possesses a flagellar antigen or the H antigen which has two phases phase 1 and phase 2. Now, why is the flagellar antigen called H antigen? It goes after the word German word Hosch, which show means it spreads like a film across the medium. Now, it can only spread like a film across the medium, it has flagella which helps it to spread across the medium. O antigen, the word somatic O antigen stands for those organisms which do not have flagella will not be able to spread across the medium. So, this particular antigen is not associated with the ability of the organism to spread. So, it is called on Hosch or lack of flagellar antigen. The surface antigen is also referred to as the VI antigen. Now, on the basis of its antigens, Kaufman White classified the organism into various groups. The total groups which have been differentiated have been called group A to Z and then they were later on numbered as 1, 2, 3, 4. <coughs> now, the common ones which we are concerned with are group A, group B and group D. Characteristic of group A is the factor 2 antigen which is present on the surface of the organism and it is seen in Salmonella paratyphi A which belongs to group A, which is a com one of the common causative agents of enteric fever also. Group B contains the factor 4 antigen for O antigen. Here we are referring to the O antigen, example of which is Salmonella paratyphi B, which is again a common organ isolate which we may get common times in food poisoning and from unusual sites. Group D is what contains Salmonella typhi where the O antigen is factor 9. Within each group you can differentiate the serotypes by phase 1 and phase 2 flagellar antigen. Now, so this particular isolate was confirmed to be Salmonella typhi by a slide agglutination test. First polyvalent O antisera were used which was positive, then we used group D or O9 antisera it was positive, then poly H was used it was positive, then HD antisera were used and they were all positive which confirmed think that this was Salmonella typhi which we had isolated from this patient's blood. So, this is what the agglutination of the polyvalent O looked like. Then the antibiotic sensitivity had been put up side by side, it was sensitive to cefamendol, ceftriaxone, cefoperazon, chloromycetine and cotrimoxazole. It was resistant to ampicillin and ciprofloxacillin and chloromycetin. It was sensitive to cefamendol, ceftriaxone, cefoperazone and crotimexazole. So, the only drug of choice which we were left for treating was ceftriaxone and cotrimexazole. If we had not got a culture positivity, we could have also run a PCR or nucleic acid detection test for diagnosis. This can be done directly on the patient sample. Blood, stool and urine can also be used for diagnosis. You can do the conventional PCR or you can do a real time PCR. As few as 10 organisms circulating in the blood can be picked up by nucleic acid detection test. So, this is very useful when the you have negative blood cultures in the presence of fever. As blood culture was positive in this particular patient, we did not go ahead with the PCR tests. <coughs> patient was hydrated with IV fluids, antibiotic was started, ceftriaxone was started intravenously, fever subsided and patient responded to treatment. 
Ciprofloxacin is usually the drug of choice which would be given in the outdoor patient, but this particular patient was resistant and this is a factor we are commonly seeing resistance with salmonella. So, this patient had to be put on ceftriaxone. Now, keeping this in mind, apart from the Kaufman White classification which we are using for serotyping, a newer classification of Salmonella has now come in. This is based on DNA hybridization. The species which is divided into two major species, the species Enterica and the species Bongori. In the species Enterica, various subspecies which are Enterica, Salami, Arizoni, Diarizoni, Houghtoni and Indica. Salmonella type can be written as Salmonella Enterica, subspecies Enterica. Serova typhi. The shorter form to write it is S typhi with the T capital. Normally, whenever we write an organism, we always write the second name with a small letter, but with Salmonella typhi, because of this new classification, Salmonella typhi, the word typhi is always written with a capital T, as you may have noticed in my previous presentations also. After that, it was sent for typing. It was sent for serotyping for using ONH antisera, because the whole spectrum of ONH antisera are not available with any laboratory. So, it can be sent to NYSET Calcutta or it can be sent to the Central Research Institute at Kasauli, we sent it to NYSET Calcutta. Then phage typing was also sent for, phage typing involves typing the VI and 11 phages which are used, further typing can be updated using O file. Phage typing is done at Lady Harding Medical College in New Delhi, but we did not send it for phage typing, we sent the isolate only for serotyping to NYSET Calcutta. Molecular typing can also be done because currently it is more an accurate form and specifically important in an outbreak. Since we had a single patient, we did not go in for molecular typing. Molecular typing can be done by looking at the plasmid DNA, looking at by profiling it, by doing a fingerprinting and doing virulence gene typing or it can be done looking at the chromosomal DNA by ribotyping pulse field gel electroporosis, which is one of the common methods done for typing of uh, gram negative bacteria. Now, Salmonella are basically parasites of humans and animals. So, it is another disease which can be transmitted to humans from animals. So, in that sense, it is a zoonotic infection. We will be studying a little more about zoonotic infections in the next session where we will be covering two more zoonotic diseases. Infection in animals may vary from asymptomatic infection to fatal illness. Some animal pathogens can also infect man. Example, Salmonella typhimurium, which is essentially an animal pathogen and usually infects man through food and food products. In humans, the presentation can be as enteric fever, which we have seen in the present patient, or it can present as gastroenteritis or food poisoning, or it can also present directly as septicemia. Enteric fever is also commonly referred to as typhoid fever, though the causative agent in the present patient was Salmonella typhi. Others, which can cause enteric fever, is also Salmonella paratyphi A. Now, how does one get infected with this particular organism? It can be through food. Infected food handlers can transmit it to other people who consume the food which has been cooked by these infected food handlers. It can also be transmitted by contaminated food in canned meat and shellfish. Desiccated coconut, raw milk and milk products are another common source of getting salmonella infection. Salmonella can also be transmitted by flies and fomites because they survive in dry soil and can be transferred on wings and legs of flies. Because flies when they sit on salmonella infected areas and then they sit again on your food, they can infect your food with salmonella. Then nosocomial infection can also occur because the caregiver has got infected with salmonella and if he is not careful with washing his hands, he can transmit salmonella to the patient or food handlers in the hospital environment can also transmit salmonella to the patient. So, it could come to you as a nosocomial infection. Occupational can happen in sewage and sludge workers and in laboratory workers who are dealing with salmonella. Drinking water and ritual bathing due to pollution of water surfaces because of sewage entering them can result in salmonella infection. So, the routes can be multiple, it can be through ingestion, it can be through contact. So, these are the two common routes, most common route is of course, by ingestion. You can ingest it through food, water and milk. The infecting dose usually varies from between 10 to the power of 3 organisms to 10 to the power of 8 organisms. Now, usually if there are less of them, then they are controlled by the acid pH of the stomach. The gastric acidity of the stomach will get rid of some of the bacteria and only the more virulent strains will survive. Now, the jejunal microflora again competes with the bacteria and it does not let it get a foothold in the small intestine. It is able to overcome that, it gets a foothold in the small intestine, where again it has to fight against the immunoglobulin A and the pancreatic enzyme, which will try and destroy the infecting pathogen. 
having gone over all this obstacle race, it finally finds and reaches attaches to the microvilli of the gut and it penetrates through the intestine by endocytosis to reach the lamina propria and in the submucosal area. So, it has reached the small intestine, it has travelled through the inter small intestine and reached the submucosa. There it is picked up by polybops and macrophages and it is taken through the mesenteric lymph nodes and transformed by the thoracic duct again back to, to the bloodstream where it causes primary bacteremia. So, this usually coincides with the onset of fever. So, before you get fever, the salmonella has passed through all this, it has travelled through your stomach, entered into the small intestine, travelled through the wall of the intestine, entered into the submucosal space, travelled through the thoracic duct into the bloodstream and causes primary bacteremia and that is when you get fever. Now, these bacteria which are travelling in the bloodstream then get seeded into various organs which form the reticulo endothelial system such as the liver, spleen and bone marrow. They multiply there and they are again released from these organs back into the blood and they cause secondary bacteremia and again you might get a fresh amount of fever. Bile is a good medium for growth of the organism. So, the bacteria which invade the gallbladder may multiply in the gallbladder and they are discharged from the gallbladder into the intestine and specifically localized in the lymph nodes of the intestine in the pears patches where they may multiply and they cause ulcerations resulting in the typical typhoid ulcers which are described or enduring typhoid which we are worried about as one of the complications of typhoid. These ulcers will heal over 3 to 4 weeks once they are formed. So, they take a long time to heal. Now, on the incubation period of the disease after you have had this thing will depend on the virulence of the bacteria, the infecting dose and the susceptibility of the host. In low doses of infection that is waterborne infection, there will be a longer incubation period which may range from 18 to 21 days because the bacteria will multiply locally in the intestine and then it will invade through the wall of the intestine. In high dose infection which is usually food borne, there is a short incubation period and it can vary from 6 to 9 days. Now, the onset of the infection is usually with fever, headache, malaise and coated tongue which tells you the patient is not well. In the first week, there will be a stepwise increase in fever with relative bradycardia which we saw in this particular patient also, anorexia and abdominal discomfort. If the patient is not treated and during this week, in the second week the fever again rises, you will get rose spots all over the body which presents like a small rash which are described as rose spots. Patient may land up with mental confusion, splenomegaly and may be associated with hepatomegaly at a later stage. By the third week, patient presents with diarrhea, disorientation, toxemia and fever starts falling by lysis. Complications of typhoid usually are a relapse in the fever, hemorrhages because of ulceration occurring in the pears patches, ulceration and perforation of the pears patches and a carrier state which will persist even after the patient has recovered from the fever. Others can be persistent jaundice, renal impairment, cystitis, central nervous system infection resulting in ataxia and polyneuritis and other pyogenic complications which can occur at any site. You may get abscesses in the lung, in the, uh, in the bones. So, you can get abscesses at multiple sites or in different sites which can present specifically usually in Salmonella paratyphi B infection. To summarize, how does one diagnose Salmonella typhi? In the first week, the test for diagnosis is blood culture or a bone marrow culture, which would be positive in 90 to 95 percent of the patients if no antibiotic has been taken. But usually, the patient has taken antibiotics by the time the patient comes to the hospital. So, the positivity rate of the blood culture goes down. In the second week again, blood culture would still be positive in the earlier phase, but the positive rate has come down to 50 percent. Stool culture could be positive in this phase. And the Vidas test starts becoming positive as the antibodies start appearing. In the third week, the Vidal test is nicely positive by now and would be positive in 100 percent of the patients. So, you can imagine it takes 3 weeks for the Vidal test to become nicely positive. The stool culture now starts positivity rate starts decreasing. The blood culture again might give you a strong positivity because of the secondary bacteremia. The reservoirs of infection usually are acute cases and chronic and convalescent carriers. More commonly seen in the summer and the monsoon months and in the age group, so it can range anywhere from 5, 5 to 20 years, but more commonly seen in the age group 15 to 20 years. This is quite often because this is the age group which is eating food outside which may not be properly cooked. Incidence is about 1 to 3 percent. Typhoid to paratyphoid ratio is 10 is to 1. In the paratyphoid, the paratyphoid A is more prevalent in India. 
The carrier state which you will see in patients after they have recovered could present to you as convalescent carriers, as temporary carriers or as chronic carriers. Convalescent carriers are patients who continue to shed typhoid bacilli in their feces for 3 weeks to 3 months after clinical cure. Temporary carriers are those who shed bacilli for a between 3 months to a less than 1 year after they have recovered from a typhoid infection. Chronic carriers are those who continue to shed the bacilli for even more than a year. Now, these are the dangerous ones because they share it to the community. A famous chronic carrier person who is described as typhoid Mary, this is a picture of typhoid Mary has appeared in the papers. She was a cook and she was causing infection wherever she was cooking food. She has over 15 years in the period that she worked as a cook, she caused 7 outbreaks and affected more than 200 persons. If you notice her frying pan, you will see lot of skulls entering into her frying pan because lot of mortality was observed in typhoid in those times when we did not have adequate treatment for typhoid. So, lot of people lost their lives because she was a carrier and nobody detected that she was a carrier and treated the carrier state. So, she continued to infect people and she is famously known as typhoid Mary though her name was Mary Mallon. Now, how would one have diagnosed that she was a carrier? We could have attempted an isolation of the bacillus from the feces or bile of this particular patient. You could demonstrate antibodies to the VI antigen that would give an indication that you are dealing with a carrier and you can trace the location of a carrier. If you do not know who the carrier is and an outbreak is occurring by using sewer swabs placed at various places in the drainage to find out which particular part of the drain you will get salmonella and that carrier stays in which particular part of a city if you are looking for localization of an outbreak. Now, apart from enteric fever, there can be other manifestations that I had told you earlier. It can present you with enteritis or can present you with septicemia. Now, first let us look at enteritis. The most common form of salmonellosis which is food borne is presenting to you as enteritis. So, it gives food borne outbreaks and occasionally sporadic diseases can also occur. The infectious dose in the food is about 10 to 8 colony forming units. This usually occurs in poultry, eggs, milk and milk products. Poultry and eggs are very uh, notoriously known to be infected with salmonella. The incubation period can vary from 6 to 48 hours depending on the infected dose. The common symptoms in these particular patients is nausea, vomiting, non bloody diarrhea, fever, abdominal cramps, myalgia and headache, electrolyte imbalance and dehydration. The common pathogens which could be involved in this particular form of enteritis are usually the animal pathogens such as salmonella enteritis and salmonella typhimurium. So, these are commonly seen. So, these are the, end, the zoonotic form essentially of salmonella infections presenting to you as food poisoning. So, one of the common agents of food poisoning which you will also see in that session on food poisoning. Apart from food poisoning, salmonellosis can also present to you directly as septicemia. This is again more commonly seen with the animal pathogens specifically salmonella cholera sui, salmonella paratyphi C and salmonella Dublin. Old, young, so extremes of life and immunocompromised patients are at increased risk of presenting directly with septicemia. Transmission is usually by the oral route. It has a very short incubation period and then high remittent fever is seen right from the start of the infection. So, local suppuration eventually occurs because of septicemia and different organs and patient may present to you with pyogenic lesions also. Prevention of salmonella is very important. So, this usually requires improvement in sanitation, provision of protected water supply, protect recipients by immunization with vaccines, which could be there are three types of vaccines are seen the TAB vaccine, live attenuated vaccine and the VI based parenteral subunit vaccine. So, essentially it is to improve the infrastructure by improving sanitation and better water supply, because this is not a part of the normal immunization which we give people. Now, let us look at the three vaccines which are available against salmonella. The conventional vaccine which was used earlier was the TAB vaccine which contained salmonella typhi 100 million colony forming units per ml, salmonella paratyphi A and paratyphi B as 750 million units per ml. This was a killed vaccine, two doses were required 0.5 ml subcutaneously at intervals of 4 to 6 weeks. The side effects of it were local reaction as a site of infection and fever. It did not improve the cell mediated immunity or the local immunity. So, this is not really favored and because the pa patients were worried about the side effects such as the fever. The live attenuated oral vaccine then came in, it was the typhoral vaccine which is essentially 
formed by the salmonella typhi ty21a strain it is a stable mutant the dosage is one capsule on alternate day for 4 days one hour before meals with cool water because we do not want the organisms to die before they reach the intestine its efficacy varies from 67 to 80 percent duration of immunity is long for 7 years booster capsules 4 capsules can be given every 5 years specifically in endemic areas Adders, adverse effects are only mild gi disturbances and pyrexia so this is a good vaccine to be used for long term protection against salmonella and it gives you local immunity also a third vaccine which is used is the VI based parenteral subunit vaccine which is developed from the wild strain of salmonella typhi TY2. Dosage is a single injection that is the benefit of this particular vaccine which can be given subcutaneous or intramuscularly. So, this is actually ideal for food handlers and can be given in the hospital scenario specifically to food handlers in the hospital. Drawback is it does not stimulate the mucosal immunity and its adverse effects are pain, redness, induration at the injection site fever and rarely allergic rashes. So, that is all about salmonella as we see it. These are some of the images which we have used. Majority of the images have courtesy the microbiology department of BJ Government Medical College and a few of the images have been taken from other sites on the internet. So, I would like to thank all the authors whose images have been used in this. Just to summarize with two more doctor before we conclude, we have discussed three forms of salmonella infection, the enteric fever the enteritis or the gastroenteritis from manifestation and the septicemia. In the first week of infection, blood culture is the best method for diagnosis. In the second week of infection, the blood culture still remains as an ideal method of diagnosis, the Vidal test starts becoming positive. By the second week of infection, serological tests such as the Vidal test are better th methods of diagnosis. The Vidal test has its limitations and we still need to think look for better tests for diagnosis of salmonella fever. So, thank you. Let us keep in mind that the egg and the chicken depend, does not matter who came first whether the egg came first or the chicken came first, but both of them can still cause you salmonella infection. So, please make sure that you cook them properly before you have either the egg or the chicken. Thank you.